The broadcast of the Minneapolis Pol Policy and Government Oversight Committee will now begin. Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Jenkins, and I am the chair of the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Wednesday, June 16th. I'd like to note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under the Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Section 13D.021, due to the declared state of local public health emergency. I will also note that the city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Rake. Councilmember Rake. Gordon. Here. Fletcher. Here. Cunningham. Councilmember Cunningham. Osman. Here. Goodman. Present. Cano. Councilmember Cano. Bender. Here. Schrader. Here. Johnson. Here. Palmasano. Present. Councilmember Rake. Cunningham. Cano. Vice Chair Ellison. Present. Chair Jenkins. Present. There are 10 members present. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Let the record reflect. We do have a quorum. Colleagues, um, the first item on our agenda today is a quasi judicial uh, item related to the defense and indemnification of Officer Clifton Tolls in the matter of Lucas McDonough v. Clifton Tolls, City of Minneapolis and Fosslin Olson Inc. doing business as the 1029 Bar. The action before us today is to adopt findings of fact and conclusions of law and to either approve or deny defense and indemnification for Officer Clifton Tolls um, in the matter listed on the agenda. This is a quasi-judicial item, meaning that this committee's action and the council's final decision will be based on the entire official record of this matter, which has been provided to both bodies by the city attorney's office and council's decision is eligible for appeal. As noted on the agenda, staff is recommending that we deny defense and indemnification, find, adopt all findings of fact, except finding of fact number five, adopt all conclusions of law, except conclusions of conclusion of law number eight, and adopt the recommendation of Administrative Law Judge James R. Mortensen in Office of Administrative Hearings Matter 5-6010-36662. Additionally, staff recommends finding that at the time of this incident, Chokeholds were permitted by MPD only where deadly force was authorized. Based on the record, staff recommendations concluding that a chokehold was not authorized by MPD policy or the applicable statutes under the circumstances set forth in the record. Staff from the city attorney's office is on hand to answer any questions that we may have. And we will also uh, provide Mr. Tolles or his attorney the opportunity to address the committee. Before I check with staff to see if Mr. Uh, before I check with staff to see if Mr. Tolles or his attorney is on hand, um, which I do believe they are, 
Um, does any of my colleagues have any questions for the city attorney's office? Are there any questions for the city attorney's office? Uh, seeing none from my colleagues, um, I will invite um, Mr. Tolles and or his attorney to address the committee. Committee, um, we will allocate 10 minutes uh, to address the committee, Mr. Tolles, if you are available um, and or your attorney on your behalf, um, we have 10 minutes to speak. Uh, Mr. Tolles, if you are calling in, you can press star six to unmute yourself. Can you? Okay. Hello? Hello. Yes, I'm sorry. I was muted, I guess. Um, I just want to say thank you for allowing me uh, the time to speak with you. Thanks to the committee and everyone who was involved in this matter. Um, I hope I don't need 10 minutes. Uh, I'm calling in to let you know. My name is Clifton Tolls. I am, you know, I grew up in Minneapolis on the north side. I currently live on the north side with my wife and my kids, and we've been there for 16 plus years. Um, what I'm calling in to ask of you is to please, please reconsider the evidence of this matter. I have read Judge Mortensen's report to you. It does not include the facts of this case, nor does the city of Minneapolis uh, uh, report and what they've done includes the facts of this case. I have been asking for this for day one to just please review the evidence of this case and it would, it would prove that I acted in the scope of my profession at the time under the policy of, of MPD. I have been on the department just a little over five years. I have never, never used force within the scope of my profession. I grew up in North Minneapolis and parts of South Chicago. I have never been in a fight. I'm not a hothead. I've, this matter was an isolated incident which the bar staff knew I was a police officer and they asked me to get involved. I was assaulted at the scene and I acted in defense. I notified my supervisor as I was trained to do from the academy and according to MPD policies. What I'm asking the committee to do today is please, as the city ask you to take into account Lucas McDonough's claims and he was rewarded for his actions, I'm asking you to please reconsider and look at the fact of this case, okay? Because if you do that, you will see that I acted within the scope of my profession and not as some wild loose cannon. That is, I mean, honestly, unless anyone have questions, that is all I'm asking you to do, to please, please reconsider this and look at the fact, look at the city has my, my attorney final argument to this matter. And I'm asking you to please reconsider that before you make your final ruling. Uh, thank you, uh, Officer Tolles. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Tolles? Are there any questions? Mr. Toes, I do believe you have a few more minutes. Was that the conclusion of your yeah. remarks? Yeah, I would I would just like to highlight one thing here about this matter. And that, that, that thing is important here. Please take into account that this matter happened in 2017. In 2017, that's when this happened. 
I've reached out to the city, to the chief's office repeatedly in regards to see where were we going with this, whether, you know, because as I advanced in my career, I wanted to know where this entire matter was. One thing to highlight here is that on June 18 of 2020, miraculously, unexpectedly, without any notification, I was handed out a 300-hour suspension by the city of Minneapolis and the department. I was handed out a suspension from, from, for 300 hours. At the time, my wife was not working, and I got sent home for three-plus months during that time. This was after Mr. Floyd's unfortunate death. That is just something to take into account. Prior to that, I have reached out over and over asking, and I got nothing back from the department or from the city. No phone calls, nothing. And miraculously, I was suspended and sent home for 300 hours. So that is one thing I wanted to highlight and let the committee know what happened during that process. All right, thank you. Um, I see we have uh, Ms. Lathrop from the city attorney's office in queue to speak. Ms. Lathrop. Thank you, Chair Jenkins and members of the committee. Um, <clears throat> my name is Sarah Lathrop and I'm one of the attorneys from the city attorney's office that uh, handled this matter. Um, I just wanted to provide some context to the committee and, and answer any questions the committee may have. Um, I appreciate Mr. Tulsa's comments. I just wanted to provide some background. Um, so pursuant to the applicable statute, the only questions with regard to defense and indemnification are whether Mr. Tolles acted in the performance of his duties as a Minneapolis police officer when he engaged in an altercation with Lucas McDonough at the bar as described in the record, which the committee has. And even if he was acting in the performance of his duties as a Minneapolis police officer, did he act with malfeasance, bad faith, or willful neglect of duty? Um, there's a tremendously large record where Mr. Tolles was provided um, a year of discovery, basically, and then a four day evidentiary hearing before an administrative law judge um, represented by counsel, and he presented a large amount of information. Um, the judge looked at all of the evidence, the witnesses, the exhibits that were presented, and found that based on a preponderance of the evidence that Mr. Tolles was out drinking and socializing at the bar, that he encountered Mr. McDonough, and according to eyewitnesses and Mr. McDonough, Mr. Tolles, without provocation, uh, put him in a chokehold, dragged him out of the bar, then outside of the bar, pushed him, then punched him in the face, fracturing his face bones and no making message. him, excuse me, making him fall to the ground where he cracked his head open and suffered a traumatic brain injury. Um, that is what the administrative law judge found the evidence supported based on all of the evidence. Um, he also found that there was no cause for Mr. Tolles to remove Mr. McDonough from the bar. Um, an outside agency, the St. Paul Police Department, investigated the matter because he worked for the police department. Um, eight witnesses testified. Eyewitnesses gave statements on body-worn camera. All of that information was considered, and the conclusions are in the record that you've been um, provided. Mr. Tolles' attorney's arguments um, are also in the transcript that you've been provided. And with all of that information, um, the staff of the city attorney's office recommends that this committee um, conclude that the defense and indemnification should be denied um, based on the facts and the law. So I'm, I will stand for any questions if there are any. Thank you, Ms. Lathrop. Uh, I see we have a question from Council Member Gordon. Just to clarify, make it really clear. So he was not at work as a Minneapolis police officer and employee at the time. Thank you, Council Member Gordon. He was employed as a police officer at the time, but on the evening on, uh, and in question, he was out as a patron of the bar in his personal time. And he wasn't even working as an off-duty officer in any capacity whatsoever. Correct, Council Member Gordon. Thank you. Sir? Sir? If, if I may. Is that Mr. Tolles? Hello, sir. Mr. Gordon. Hello. 
Yeah, Mr. Tolls, please, please go ahead. If you're speaking, you're muted. We can't hear you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, Mr. Tolls, we can hear you. However, I do want to just let you know, we this this is not a, uh, you know, you've had an opportunity to speak. The city attorney, it, this, this is not intended to be a back and forth. I will allow oh. it for this particular time, but we are not going to engage in a back and forth dialogue throughout this entire Thank you, presentation. Sir. And this, is, this is my only time that I will. I just wanted to highlight one point in regards to Ms. Slate for a, a comment as far as please note that bar staff have testified and there is record of this that they knew I was a police officer and based on Mr. McDonough's behavior, I was put I was notified of his behavior. OK, I did not just go ahead and act on my own. I was notified of a, of a unruly patriot in the bar and they knew I was a police officer. That is why they approached me with this matter. That is the final thing I just want to say. I thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Again, please look at the totality of the circumstances before making your final ruling. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions for Ms. Later? Uh, seeing none, um, I will um, ask if any of my colleagues um, have a motion. Is there a motion? Uh, <clears throat> Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will make a motion to adopt staff findings and deny indemnification. Um, thank you, Council Member Palmasano. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay. Were you able to capture that? Madam Clerk. Yes. Um, Council Member Fletcher. We we uh, I should say we now have a proper motion and second, and we are now in discussion of this motion. Council Member Fletcher. I I was in queue to make the motion. Uh, oh. That Council Member Palmasano made. Thank you, Council Member Gordon. You same. Same. Thank you. So we now have a proper motion and um, second. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Reich. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Connor. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Rake. Cunningham. Cano. Aye. Vice Chair Ellison. Aye. Chair Jenkins. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That item carries, uh, and that recommendation will be referred to the City Council meeting for final action. Um, the next item we have is the consent agenda in which there are um, 31 items. Items number two through 32. Item number two is the setting of a public hearing for June 30th, 2000, 
21 to consider an ordinance amending Title II of Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to the administration creating a new Department of Arts and Cultural Affairs and amending related regulations. Item number three is the appointed position, Director, HR Internal Workplace Investigations in the Human Resources Department. And number four approves the appointment of Council Member Lene Palmasano as the city's designated representative to the um, MSP Noise Oversight Committee. Item number five is the passage of a resolution accepting and appropriating funds under the American Rescue Plan Act. Item number six authorizes the no donation of information technology equipment to PCs for people and free Greek twin cities, free geek twin cities. Items seven through nine are various contract amendments. Item number 10 authorizes a contract with Microsoft Corporation for end-to-end -end managed technical support of Microsoft products. Item number 11 authorizes a contract with Deloitte Consulting LLP to provide benefits consulting and actuarial services. Item 25, 12 through 25 are various contract amendments related to the new public service building project. Item 26 to 32 are various legal settlements. Would any of my colleagues like to pull any items from today's consent agenda? Would any of my colleagues like to pull any items from today's consent agenda? Seeing none, I will move approval of items 2 through 32. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will now ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Rake. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Kano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Councilman Barrake. Cunningham. Vice Chair Ellison. Aye. Chair Jenkins. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and those items are approved. Next we have on our agenda is discussion item. I'm sorry, um, Council President Bender, do you have a question or comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm so sorry. I um, have been having issues with my internet. Um, I. We just approved the the um, a consent agenda. I have made a practice, and I wanted to today note that we had a number of worker compensation claims, as you described, as you were going through the consent agenda. I just want for transparency to say that we get questions about these, and we are limited in the information that we're able to share. Um, the city attorney and um, I think staff from the coordinator's office have been able to answer some questions in the past. I know, um, you know, we've had some some updates as well as council members. But I just want to note again for transparency that um, these are coming through and we are getting questions about them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam President. And um, so I will move to our discussion item, item number thirty-three on our agenda which is a presentation on the proposed city charter amendment relating to government structure. I'll invite um, Carolyn Bashum from the city attorney's office to provide that presentation. Thank you, Chair Jenkins and uh, members of the committee. 
My name is Carol Bashoon. I'm an assistant city attorney with the city of Minneapolis. And I'm here to talk about the Charter Commission's proposed charter amendments. Next. Next. I just wanted to give a general summary of what these charter amendments do. Uh, the proposed language is in LIMS and also in the resolution that you will be considering today. Basically, it will uh, delineate what the city council and the mayor uh, authority is uh, within the city of Minneapolis. The city council will be the legislative body of the city with legislative policy making and oversight authority. The mayor would become the chief executive officer with the executive and administrative authority. Next. The uh, mayor would generally appoint all the department heads with the city council's consent, and the mayor would have the ability to discipline, suspend, and discharge all of the mayoral appointments, and that would include the police chief, the officers were generally appointed for four years and that would coincide with the mayor's term. Currently, the city um, or pardon me, currently the police chief has a three year term and most officers now have the default two year terms. So this would increase their term to four years. Next. The charter amendment would also remove the executive committee so it would no longer ex exist. The city council would appoint the city clerk and the city clerk would serve at the city council's um, at, uh, at their basically whim um, and it would require nonpartisan staff. Now the, this is new staff that would be supervised by the city clerk's office. The staff would not be assigned to individual council members. The staff would be uh, working on issues related to uh, the full city council or the council committees. And if you need any specific uh, details on that, I'm sure Casey Carl could provide more detail on that. Next. The charter amendment would also create an independent city auditor's office. The auditor would audit the city's finances and operations and the audit committee would oversee the entire office. Now the city already has an ordinance which relates to an auditor's office. However, uh, there are some distinctions here. The audit committee appoints the auditor. That would be the same in the ordinance and in the charter, but uh, the term would be different. Uh, the term under the charter would be at least four years for the auditor. The city council would set the term, but it would have to be at least four years. And the city council could also remove the auditor for cause. Um, under the ordinance, the audit committee would remove the auditor. So there are some distinctions there. Next. Uh, staff direction was given to the city attorney's office by the city council on May 14th. And generally it was for the city attorney's office to do a legal analysis of the amendments to see if they should be placed on the ballot and if so, to provide some ballot language. Uh, the city attorney's office did pro provide a legal memo and that has been placed in limbs and uh, ballot language and was provided also in a resolution. And I'll just go through a little bit more about the legal analysis. Next. Ms. Bichon, can I just interrupt you for a uh, quick moment i think we have a question or a comment from council member gordon sure <clears throat> well thank you and i um i also could wait if, if if i wanted i just maybe though we could go back quickly to the appointment process which right now it goes through the executive committee and you said the mayor will make the appointment with the um, consent of the council and is the assumption the consent of the council is a simple majority vote at a full council meeting? Or is this something that would go through the council committee process? Uh, uh, council member Gordon, members of the committee. Um, I don't, I can tell you that uh, it, it looks, there's no, it's not specifically listed that it would be anything other than a majority. So it would just be a simple majority. 
Um, and as far as going through the council committees, or I don't know what the internal processes would be, but the charter requires two things. It requires the uh, mayor to um, appoint with the, and then the city council to consent. Okay, and right now, um, it's the um, department heads are pretty unique in that with some department heads, the council is able to um, give a direction but we've also heard with one department head in particular, we don't have any authority to give them any kind of staff directive. Um, what would 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 all the department heads now be aligned where we would only be able to make requests of them or requests of the mayor as a council? Or could we continue to direct, you know, like the public works director to please bring us information about crashes in the city or something like that? Would we have that kind of authority? Um, as a legislative versus a governing body? Um, I'm, I'm not sure um, as to the specifics of that. I can tell you that the charter does provide under 7.1 a separation of powers. And so the separation of powers talks about uh, when the city council can be involved in the daily interactions of uh, related to the city. So I would suggest looking at that provision um, it's under H, executive function, separation of powers. Um, also, the city council has the general, uh, uh, they're going to be the legislative body. Uh, they're, the city council would have general legislative authority, which of course would be like ordinances. Um, some policy would also have policy making authority and oversight. So you would have some oversight ability. But as far as how the details of these amendments would play out, I can't give you specifics at this point. And uh, just just recall, just just for your benefit, um, you know whether or not you like the details of these amendments, that's not at issue. We just need to decide whether uh, this should be placed on the ballot, whether it's legal to be placed on the ballot. And within the ability, within the confines of what can be in a charter, and then uh, the city council has to determine what the ballot language will be. So whether you agree with the language or not, um, that's not an issue at this time. Well, I understand that, but um, for us, for me to determine that the ballot language is actually correct and comprehensive enough, and I noticed that we actually add some explanations to it because it seems to be so confusing and now apparently incredibly vague um, about what it actually means. Um, it's really important that I understand some of that. I mean, I get that the executive committee is being stripped away and I noticed that appears in the proposed ballot language, um, but I don't really, um, I don't know, I'm concerned about the proposed language and then the um, extra ex explanations about it, um, especially if that's not really clear. So it's not going to make every department head this, it's the same as the police chief is now. That's what you're saying. Are they going to be equal or are they still going to be split differently? I'm sorry, I'm, I, could you rephrase your question? I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, right now we are, we've been told by the attorney's office that we cannot direct the police, the department, the head of the police department to do anything. We can't give a directive. We can make requests. Um, with all of the other departments, we could make a directive and they would realize that uh, we are the governing body and they'll respond to our directive. Does this change that at all? Is it going to be moving? Any, does it change that at all? Uh, again, I, I can't tell you specifically. I gave you the provisions that you can look at. I looked at him um, to, and it seemed really clear that it was changing him. We have to get the mayor's consent to actually do any directives. I mean, you could read the language to us if you want to, but it seemed really clear that it does change that potentially dramatically, or at least creates such a gray area that there will be big fights between the mayor and the council about whether or not you could do that. And it would depend. And it's, it, it basically says it's up to the mayor in one of those sentences. Wouldn't you say that? Again, I, I'm not interpreting the language at this time. Um, I'm not going to interpret exactly what it says. I can tell you that the uh, the mayor would have uh, the ability to appoint and discharge all of these officers, including the police chief. 
but I can't I can't go into the details of how this would play out. That's not what we're here for today. I understand you're talking about the ballot language. We'll be going over the ballot language. That seems like it gets very detailed into the ballot, would, would be very detailed information in the ballot language. We can look at the ballot language. We can also, um, you know, look at the language this for this committee, and we can also move it to another committee if there's some changes or discussion that needs to be had. Well, and I certainly realize that you this isn't your amendment or anything, and you don't, you're not here to defend it. Um, but I'm just trying to understand what it might mean so that we can make sure that voters have clear language on the ballot. So appreciate your time, and I'll continue to listen. Okay. Um, I know that we have a few other people in queue, Council Member Schrader, Council President Bender, uh, as well as, um, but also um, the city clerk has offered to maybe expound a little bit on Council Member Gordon's question. So um, I think we will um, allow that to happen then we'll come back to council member schrader and bender's questions if that is okay with my colleagues council i mean i'm sorry um clerk uh carl uh, madam vice president if it's okay with you perhaps ms bashun could just finish her presentation i certainly have comments i could add i've worked very closely with her obviously um on this issue and on the development of the proposal by the charter commission um, and I'm happy to add or offer my understanding or perspective of that question, but might be easier for her to finish the presentation and then address those questions. All right, thank you. Well, uh, prior to your offer, we had Council Member Schrader and Council President Bender in queue. Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Chair Jenkins. I'm, I'm happy to wait till the end of the presentation and when we see the bell language. Great. Uh, Council President Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I do think at some point it would be helpful for us to learn from staff how we can get more information, like the specific questions Councilmember Gordon was asking uh, for our constituents for whom they will experience uh, a large shift in how they receive government services if this were to pass. So I, I also have a lot of specific questions about how it would operate in practice. I also know that we received some direction from the city attorney's office related to um, ethics around sharing information and asking, answering questions about charter amendments, which I assume would also apply to this one. So my questions are, are kind of about communications. Got it, thank you. Um, Ms. Bashun. Okay, thank you, um, Chair Jenkins and members of the committee. Um, so the legal standard for the charter amendment includes the amendment must be a proper subject for the Minneapolis Charter, and it must be constitutional under both state and the US Constitution and comply with federal laws, state laws, and the state public policy. So I'm gonna go through both of those. Next. For, this is actually a charter charter amendment, not a petition, but uh, the charter amendment must um, be a proper subject for the charter. Uh, under Chapter 410, which governs both charters and charter commissions, there's a statute that says that a charter may provide for the establishment and administrative of all departments of a city government. I believe that's what this amendment is doing. It's looking at the administrative of the government where the city council would be the legislative body. The mayor would be the chief executive officer. It also establishes a, a new office in the charter, the city auditor's office. It also lays out the administration of the city clerk and it creates some new nonpartisan staff that's supervised by the city clerk. So it is a proper subject for the charter. Next. The petition also meets the legal requirements. Uh, it's not contrary to the constitutions and it complies with all laws. 
In fact, there is a state statute that specifically states that a charter can include any form of government that's not inconsistent with the Constitution, and it specifically includes the mayor council form of government, and that's exactly what this charter amendment is related to. The charter amendment uh, delineates uh, the mayor's authority and the council's and the council's authority. So it does meet the legal requirements to be placed on the ballot in that it complies with federal law, state law, and state public policy and the constitutions. Next. Uh, and uh, in the memo, the legal memo that was provided, the city attorney made these findings that the amendment is a proper subject to be placed in the charter. It's constitutional and complies with federal and state laws and state public policy and that it should be placed on the ballot in the form of a ballot question at the November 2nd, 2021 uh, election. Next. So when the legal standards that we've discussed have been met, uh, what's next? The council has to create a ballot question for the November 2nd, 2021 ballot and the deadline to uh, provide that ballot question to the county auditors August 20th. So as I stated to Council Member Gordon, we do have some time. So if in fact we don't come, if we don't agree to some ballot uh, language at this uh, committee meeting to recommend to the full city council, it could be held over to another committee meeting to discuss further. Next. So there are some questions, there are some standards for what a ballot question should look like. It has to be sufficient to identify the amendment clearly and to distinguish it from other questions on the ballot. It has to be concise um, and it has and it can include the explanatory note format that you'll see in this particular uh, proposed ballot language. Now the Minnesota Attorney General's Office uh, allowed this explanatory note format in two Attorney General opinions. Actually one of them did relate to the form of government. So that's the format that is proposed. Um, it seems like it provides a lot of information to the voters so they can clearly understand what they're voting on. Next. Now I'm going to go through the proposed ballot language <clears throat> and uh, this is just the beginning portion of it. First of all, all ballot language, all ballot questions have to be answered in the form of yes or no. So that's exactly the, what the start of this does. It has to have a title which has to be at least 10 um, or up, up to 10 words. So this is title Executive Mayor Legislative Council. It's a very broad title. Um, and it also in this question gives the brief information about it. Uh, it talks about the city charter being amended to make the mayor the chiefs uh, the city's chief executive author and administrative authority and to make the city council the legislative body with the general legislative policy making an oversight authority in the city. That's language that is in the charter amendment. The next portion of this um, relates to adding in the explanatory note and this is the language that was provided in those attorney general opinions. With the general nature of the amendments being briefly indicated in the explanatory note below, which is made a part of this ballot. So in other words, we're incorporating the explanatory note into the question of which will be answered yes or no. Uh, next. This is the first part of the explanatory note. Um, I wanted to let you know that the uh, Charter Commission did provide some proposed ballot language. I've modified this slightly. If you don't like my modifications, that could be uh, removed. But I'll, I'll tell you that in these first two paragraphs, there's slight modifications. Um, I'll just go through it and then I'll let you know what the modifications are. Again, it goes into the city being the, the mayor being the chief executive officer and administrative authority. And uh, this paragraph, first paragraph, generally deals with what the mayor would do. The mayor would direct and supervise all the department's officers and employees. Um, the free, for interference, free from interference by the city council and, and its members is taken from language in the charter amendments. And the mayor would appoint with the city council's consent all department heads unless 
the charter or any other applicable law provides otherwise. All officers appointed by the mayor, I did add this language, including the police chief, uh, will have a four year term that coincides with the mayor's term and could be disciplined and discharged for the mayor. This next paragraph I did add also. So uh, in the former paragraph, including the police chief was added. And also this paragraph, there would still be a police department. The city council would still be required to fund a police force of at least 1.7 employees per thousand residents. The reason why that additional language is included is because we are not looking at this ballot language alone. We are looking at some other uh, ballot questions being on the ballot. Uh, there is a petition uh, brought forward by the voters to change the, the uh, police department uh, by removing the police department and creating a new department of public safety. There is also a council member proposed language um, which would also create a department of public safety. So it appears that uh, most likely at least the petition language uh, would be going forward on the ballot. So there is a requirement that the, um, the, the ballot questions be able to be distinguishable. And that's why I put that in there because we will have some questions that deal with a public safety department and I wanted to specify that this would have a police department versus a, a removal of a police department and a creation of a department of public safety. Again, if you don't like that addition, that could be removed. Uh, next. This is the last part of the explanatory note. Uh, there are no changes uh, to these paragraphs from what was provided by the Charter Commission. The uh, first paragraph here, uh, talks about the city council as the city's legislative body with the general legislative policy policy making and oversight authority. And the council would continue to appoint and discharge the city clerk and the council would be assisted by this new nonpartisan administrative staff and could be assisted by aides. The executive committee would be abolished. Um, the executive committee had roles in appointments, suspensions, and discharges of officers. Those would all be abolished. In the last paragraph of the explanatory note, it relates to the city auditor's office, that the city council must establish this independent auditor's office and an audit committee to oversee that, that office. The audit committee would appoint the auditor for a term of at least four years and the city council may remove the auditor for cause because if you look at the amendments, the uh, there would have to be um, a hearing and uh, it would have to be for cause. So next, so that is the ballot language um, that were that is being proposed, and we can talk about that after this presentation. Uh, next, and then uh, how does a, the ballot question get passed? Well, first of all, it would be put on the November 2nd, 2021 ballot. Um, and we would look at who's voting on that ballot question. Uh, you only look at those who voted on the ballot question and 51% of those people, if they vote in favor of it, then it has passed. If 51% is achieved, this these amendments would be effective 30 days after the election. There's no specific date on which the amendments would be effective. And so therefore we go back to the default uh, in the statute of the 30 days after the election. Next. There may be questions about um, how do we communicate about this ballot question? That's a, that's a whole different topic that I think is best uh, for another day, not this particular committee meeting uh, back in 2020. The uh, Attorney General's office uh, provided an opinion to the City of Bloomington on what how funds could be used, city funds could be used uh, to talk about a ballot question. It is a complicated topic, so I suggest that we not talk about that today. And if you do need to um, discuss that, you, you could consult with the City Attorney's office. The, so that, that would be a an issue outside of the scope of this presentation. Next. 
And if you have any legal questions, uh, James Rowler, the city attorney, or I could answer them. And um, technical questions, of course, could go to Casey Carl. He's ultimately in charge of making sure that the ballot question gets over to the, uh, the auditor and that everything runs smoothly with the election. So if you have any questions at this point, I could uh, answer those. Thank you, um, Ms. Shun. We do have a few questions, uh, beginning with Council Member Schrader and Gordon, Council President Binder, and Council Member Palmasano. Council Member Schrader. Sure. Thank you, Chairman Jenkins. Uh, Ms. Bashoon, if just to try and understand how, how a voter can think about this, is it fair to say that this is currently how the Minneapolis Police Department operates with only uh, being, you know, only having oversight by the mayor and not by council? Well, the council would have, they would be the legislative body, so they they would have some authority for the legislative policy making and oversight. So there could be potentially some oversight. Potentially, but I mean that that argument would be could be made now, and we we frankly do not have that. And so I, I'm just trying to think about it from from a voter who's trying to understand this very big policy shift from a very short amount of information that's going to be on the ballot. And so from what I'm hearing from you, it is very similar to how MPD operates. And what what I'm hearing from this is that the whole entire city, including our fire department, including our health department that's dealing with a worldwide pandemic right now, as well as taking care of like areas that are now, you know, food deserts, they're handling that with our current structure. What this would change is get rid of that governance and oversight from council and make it more like the department, uh, the police department, who is basically getting investigated again by the federal the government, who is being sued right now by the state and has had multiple, multiple problems. And so for, for me, I think it's fair to tell the, the voters to really be able to look at, we have some parts of this that are enacted right now and some parts that are not. And I wanna make sure the ballot question really educates voters on what they really will be um, be voting on and what that change will do. And one of my big concerns, and that's uh, that's that's the major one. The other one talking about getting rid of the, the council staff, the person my constituents call from everything from garbage not being picked up to violations um, in the neighborhood uh, and to have that switch to a, a bureaucracy that's citywide. Uh, citizens are going to see a huge um, they're going to see a reduction in services and I don't think the ballot question really reflects that. Um, I'm not sure how, I mean that's going to be a really long explanation if we're trying to really make sure voters have a, have a fair chance on voting for the, the type of system they want. Um, as far as constituent services, the uh, constituents can still correspond with the council members. And, and very little power to do anything. They can still work. Uh, I mean, I guess I would uh, refer you to the executive function. Um, you still have the council members still have the authority to work with the uh, constituents and get information to the constituents. So um, that that is that is in the charter amendments. That, and while that that is in the charter amendments, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to debate it, I just think it's it's helpful to have, um, like I have real experience with this current system, and I can tell you constituents have asked um, questions uh, of MPD and of discipline, and I have not been able to get answers under this current system, which doesn't look like it would change under the charter, but would also just expand under this charter proposal. My constituents would not would not only not get answers from MPD around some very serious questions, but there are questions about public works, about everything from you know what we're doing around environmental justice to just even garbage being picked up would get the same, treated the same way that questions are that, that aren't getting answered right now from the police department. I guess I don't know that I have a question in there, but I would just yeah. say that's a <laughs> concern. Um, yeah, it, it, is, it is something that we have this system right now. Um, and <laughs> I, I feel like that's we need to have some real discussion about how voters can really weigh the pros and cons about this. And and I just want to comment the um, 
you know, the statute does say, say that we should have a concise statement of the nature of the question. So we, we can't like, we can't have a treatise or <laughs> we can't, you know, have two to, two pages and we need to try to fit things on the ballot. Um, so we need to just try to get out the most valid uh, general information out as to what kind of changes this will, changes will be made. Uh, so that that's the whole point of the ballot question. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Schrader and Ms. Bashoon. I, I wonder, colleagues, I know there's a number of people in queue. Um, if we are willing to let Mr. Carl um, provide some additional um, context, uh, and that may either reshape your questions or maybe even answer some of your questions, so if that is OK with the body, I will invite Mr. Carl to provide that um, context. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice President, Madam Chair. <clears throat> for some background for the body, the addition of an explanatory note, which Ms. Bashoon very carefully went through, this is the first time that the city of Minneapolis would be doing uh, an explanatory note as part of a ballot question. And it really derives from our experience in previous years putting ballot questions forward uh, and knowing that we are not allowed under state law to explain to voters what the effect of a ballot question would be when they're in the ballot booth voting, either early or on election day. We saw that last year when we had some proposed amendments to the charter related to elections, very important ballot questions that we wanted to make sure passed because if they had not passed, we would have been in conflict with state election law but we didn't provide ballot explanatory notes. So despite our best efforts with voter outreach, we know that the vast majority of voters um, show up on election day or for early voting, get their ballot, and that's the first time they're seeing that ballot question. So the addition of a ballot explanatory note allows us to provide factual, concise um, information prepared by the attorney that would inform a voter about what the effect of that question would be if adopted. The benefit to voters here is that because it is part of the ballot question, our election judges can use that explanatory statement to help explain to voters as they're filling out their ballot what the question is proposing. Without that explanatory note, we cannot offer any of that explanation or education in the polling place. So as the chief elections official for the city, I see this as a huge benefit to voters to not just have the question, which is always framed in a very legalese way, but also the explanatory note to give them that additional information about the effect of the ballot question if it's adopted. So that was our intent behind putting these ballot uh, explanatory notes forward. Ms. Bashun had done some research to see if that was possible. Those are um, procedures that are used in other states. We haven't done that here before. And so the fact that we are allowed to do it is our first attempt to do that. I think it would be a good idea for us to use the explanatory statements or notes for other ballot questions as well. Again, as a voter aid in understanding the impact of the question if adopted. Um, as she also indicated, Ms. Bishun pointed out, all ballot questions must be strictly constructed um, in conformance with state requirements for ballot questions. Um, essentially, ballot questions have to accurately inform a voter about the outcome of the proposal if it were adopted. It has to be presented in a very concise way and in a way that clearly distinguishes it from any other question on the ballot. So a voter who may not have heard of any of these proposals under the law is supposed to be able to walk in, pick up that ballot and understand each separate question on its own merits and to distinguish between those questions just from reading the ballot language. So here uh, in this particular question, the primary proposal is about government structure. It's been put forward by the Charter Commission. It's proposing to frame the city of Minneapolis in an executive mayor legislative council system, as Ms. Bashun explained, where the executive administrative functions of government are vested in the elected mayor, the legislative policymaking and oversight are vested in the elected city council. Um, what the attorney put forward then was the, uh, the careful, accurate, factual language of that in the ballot question and then in the explanatory statement. I do understand that there's some concern about how police are put in here, and I think that there are options for us to revise that language. In fact, I think we have 
um, a revision that we could present to you today uh, that might be shorter, briefer, and more accurate. And we can certainly uh, bring that up if you're interested in looking at that. Um, we do believe that the, the practice in the past, at least during my 11 years here, has been that when we've had ballot questions, because of the language that has to go forward, the attorney's office has already sort of taken the lead um, and prepared those in conformance with state statute. The council here, again, as a reminder, as I said a couple times in previous public meetings and, and memos to the council, um, the council is not playing a legislative role here, so I understand that there are uh, maybe positions or differences on the merits of it, but the council's role here is strictly ministerial. The question can't be prevented from going to, to voters. Um, it's on the language the attorneys have prepared, and so neither the, the council nor the mayor could prevent that question. Uh, no, similarly, cannot prevent the petition question from being submitted. Um, but this strictly focusing in a ministerial capacity on the language and determining if the voter understands what that uh, says. So that's what we tried to do by not only framing up the typical question you've seen in the past about the legalese with the yes or no, but by adding this new explanatory note, it was our attempt um, both through a voter education lens as well as a more detail that can be added so that in advance that would be included on the sample ballot, would be included on the official ballot that voters see in the polling place, and it is something that we in elections could work with our colleagues in communications and neighborhood and community relations to translate and provide to voters both in advance of election day and at the polls, whether early or election day voting, uh, so that voters can make, to your point, uh, council member, an informed decision about uh, their their choice on that question. So. It's a lot of explanation on the explanatory note that we've not done before, our reasoning for doing it. Um, I know there were questions about other issues, and I'm happy to uh, also respond with Ms. Bashoon or Mr. Router to those. Um, I did want to address one specific point. There was a question, and I'm not sure if I heard it correctly, so it might just be me, um, but when we were referring to council staff, the proposal actually seeks to add new staff for council, the administrative staff that would be part of uh, the city clerk's office focus on helping the council and council committees as a body. That does not eliminate or replace the existing staff, the council member aides who are already uh, in place today. Uh, I would point out that the aides that exist today are not in the charter um, and the charter amendments that are before you actually for the first time would reference those positions. So it provides essentially two different staffs for the council. It provides for the aides that you already have and it also provides for a new nonpartisan administrative staff, part of the clerk's function, to help with the legislative and oversight functions of the body and its committee. So I just wanted to clarify um, that it's not removing staff, it's actually adding staff to help council with its work. Um, and happy to stand for questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, and uh you you may have raised more questions but we you know we will see councilmember gordon thank you um i think we i really appreciate that we're trying to use an explanation i think that's really helpful um i think that we need um more time and i don't think we can write the ballot language today at this meeting i don't think i'll, I'll support this ballot language and i can't even imagine how to fix it exactly so that I would feel comfortable with something. I'm really concerned that adding that stuff about a police department is going to be super confusing because if this passes and another thing passes, well, I think then we're going to have to make sure that the police department is renamed and it isn't the police department anymore. And you're at, and it, I'm worried that'll confuse people to think I'll vote for this and, auto, and if it passes, then automatically those other ones can't possibly pass that deal with the public safety department. That gets really confusing and it doesn't mention any of the other departments that will also be remaining with this. So I appreciate that it was an attempt to do that, um, but it, it made it more confusing for me. <clears throat> and I'm still a little bit confused about what moving from governing authority to legislative authority means and the ex whole executive function thing that says the city council can't interfere with the mayor's direction or supervision of the administration. Um, well, so if we pass an ordinance that, that, that would interfere or we are discussing one that could possibly change the way it's done, I don't it, um, I don't exactly know how you would convey that in ballot language 
to really clarify just exactly how I mean, because this feels like it's a it's a power shift somehow towards the mayor. Um, and I think we we should stipulate and have that somehow laid out um, more clearly in what's going on here. And I think it's going to take more time than we can come up with at this meeting in particular. And luckily we have all the way till August um, to figure it out. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon. Um, Council President Binder. Thanks, Madam Chair. I also think that we need more time and should not vote up. I could not support this language today. And I think I, I need time to ask more questions about the um, intent and uh, how this would work in practice so that I can ascertain how to best suggest how to explain that to constituents both in the language itself and in the in the description um you know I, this is the second time i've mentioned this today i'm not going to be here when this is implemented um i think it gives me a little bit of a, a perspective to think about how you know think about this a bit in in the abstract based on my experience um as someone who who won't you know who will not be personally affected by by what happens except for as a resident um, I, I do want to know who we should ask to clarify the intent and how this would work in practice. Um, I, I have questions about how it would work to bar council members from interfering in the direction of staff that are similar to those that Councilmember Gordon has asked. There isn't any mention of budgetary authority. So while some parts of this proposal are extremely specific, like putting in the charter that constituent services will be done by administrative staff who report to the clerk rather than reporting to the council as our staff do now, um, there isn't a description of how budgetary authority would be um, distributed between the a legislative and the executive. Um, right now, a lot of a lot of budgetary decisions are made through the legislative body of the council. I also will just reflect, and I think this is why it's so important to be clear and specific in the language. You know, I'm a council member who's really interested in citywide policy and in systems. Um, and we all get lots of different questions and constituent requests depending on the ward. And there's huge disparities in the issues that constituents and businesses are facing in our city. The work is not distributed equally among council offices. Um, you know, some some council offices are dealing with um, life and death situations and others are dealing with um, things that are, you know, actually things that the city is set up much uh, better to provide for street sweeping or snow plowing, um, things that are seen as sort of integrated public services. Um, you know, so I am often someone who when I get requests about traffic safety or you know, don't de don't demolish this building, or you know, um, feedback about particular tra transportation issues or land use and housing has been a big issue in Ward 10. My approach had has been to take a policy approach to amend our comprehensive plan, to update our city's land use policies, to champion a complete streets policy, a Vision Zero policy, to make budget investments citywide. Um, and I will say that the you know. I get pushback from my constituents who want me as their council member to advocate more directly with staff to intervene in specific issues. Um, and I think that's more like how council members operated in the past, uh, more like that sort of ward boss system. Um, I think we have moved away from that toward more citywide policy, um, but but often I think the feedback we get from constituents is still wanting that kind of service that they're used to around very specific issues in the ward. And that will be really important to communicate to people so that they can decide. If folks don't want to call their council member when they have these kinds of issues, if they're happy to call the mayor's office instead, that just needs to be clear so that if it passes, that everyone knows who's in charge. Um, and there seems to be a lot of confusion now, even when the charter is extremely clear that the mayor has complete control over the police department. You know, our constituents don't say, oh, great, thanks, I'll just call the mayor. They demand that we do something about police. Um, so there is that tension. I want to reflect that this is a conversation that's happening all over the country. 
Austin just had a ballot question that failed around a strong mayor amendment. You know, Seattle's mayor told the council, you can fund things, but I'm not going to implement them. So there is a tension between the executive and legislative um, branches as cities grapple with issues and problems um, that are, you know, both ex extreme in the pandemic and also, you know, other layers of government are just punting more and more things to local governments. Um, so that's a long way to say I sincerely believe that we are not ready yet with this language to clearly communicate to voters what they will expect from their government um, if this change were to be implemented. It'd be helpful to know who we should ask so that we can get clarification as we weigh the language before us and the question of does this accurately reflect in there at least I think and that is who should we be asking? or more clarity. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah. Uh, Chair Jenkins, um, I would like to state that the Charter Commission put together a document called the Government Structure, Form and Function. It goes through their uh, their charter amendments and how they, there's even a chart that anticipates what the uh, council and what the mayor would be in, in charge of. And I think that might be a, a good document to look at. Um, and I think that's in limbs. It's probably in the same limbs as uh, the other documents for this meeting. Ms. Bichon, can you restate the title of that document? Yeah. Please? Yes, it's called Government Structure, Form and Function. It was submitted by the government structure work group. There was a work group that uh, worked on these charter amendments. And so um, it's a very detailed document and you might, I think it gives a lot of information on uh, potentially the intent of what the charter commission was trying to accomplish uh, when they were making these changes. So I, I would suggest that might be a good document to review. And Ms. Bashoon, I have read through the documents of the Charter Commission. I, I don't think it reflects the day-to-day -day, uh, experience of, of being a council member. Um, and so, and obviously, I mean, it's, it wouldn't be the Charter Commission determining the distribution of budgetary authority between the executive and legislative branches. If this passes, who will determine um, how it is implemented? Maybe that's the better way to ask that question. Well, I think with I just want to say with all charter um, charter questions, it's always an analysis of what does the charter mean. Uh, we always look at the legal analysis. Sometimes we have provisions that have been interpreted in the past or we've given city attorney opinions in the past. I think if there's any legal questions on how to interpret the charter for any specific provision, typically um, that's been a question for the attorney's office and that's what um, you know, we would do for any specific question that actually has come up. Um, so as far, so that's typically what's been done when, you know, there are charter provisions and a particular situation comes up. All right. Thank you. Uh, next. We have in queue Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I had my own question about how this would go because we can't pretend that these questions are going to operate in a vacuum, nor the explanatory note therein. Um, but I'm just, I'm really worried that there's some misinformation being suggested here, and some people have been following this charter amendment through the charter commission meetings closer than others. So could I propose that the clerk and the attorney set a study session to discuss all of these concerns and we can include the charter commissioners? I think it would be good to have these these questions answered in public and in a broadcast meeting. Um, and I just don't want misinformation or, or, or really questions here um, to to be carried forward. And, and I think a lot of us have other kinds of questions to ask as well. So could I ask that we do that with this 
particular item? Could we set a, a study session to discuss these questions? Um, I can't. I cannot speak. I don't think on that. Uh, it, as the city attorney, I think we could discuss that behind the scenes. Uh, I could just discuss that with Jim Router or if Eric Nelson um, would be able to talk to that. But uh, that that's definitely a possibility that we could we could consider. With all due respect, I think I'm, I'm asking the chair and the city clerk if if that seems reasonable, just okay. given the nature of of the different things going on here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Palmasano. I mean, I I certainly think that that could be beneficial, um, but I'm I'm not clear on the um, the process or or how how we may be able to to schedule it and I will just note that you know given our uh, challenges with the ARPA process as well as the budgetary process I mean time is not our greatest asset right now but uh, Mr. Clerk do you have an opinion? Madam Chair if what I heard was a proposal to put together a study session separate from the council's regular committee uh, cycle of meetings where we could um, sit and address uh, some of the bigger questions that have been addressed today and perhaps council members could uh, submit questions in advance and staff could be prepared to answer those. We could certainly invite the Charter Commission leadership to come since this is their proposal to address that um, and and at least uh, move us down the line of getting to an understanding such that the council can uh, complete its work on it's required statutory duty to adopt ballot language. We can certainly work with the president's office to find that time uh, and put that on calendars. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clerk. And Councilmember Parmesano, is that an acceptable response? I think that sounds great. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, next, we have in queue Council Member Ellison. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, I I, th I think a study session is a great idea. Um, I do have a lot of questions, uh, but I feel like so far, um, staff seem ready to present what, what we do have, but I know that a number of questions uh, that, that, my, that a lot of you all have asked uh, were maybe a little bit more difficult to answer. So, um, I'm going to hold off on my comments and questions for right now. Um, I could not support this today as written. Um, and I do think that, you know, obviously not intentionally, but I do think that that some of the some of the language in there is 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 maybe um, uh, misleading, um, especially how this would relate to other uh, potential charter amendments that could also pass hypothetically. So. Um, so yeah, so I, I think, but it sounds like there, there's a better format to get these answered questions, and and I, and I think that I've observed that a number of a number of our questions seem difficult to answer today. So um, I'll save it for the study session. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. Uh, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, I'll also keep my comments short because it sounds like we're headed towards a, a future meeting to clarify some of these things. But I do think that it's just worth, uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, reaffirming that I think the language changes that uh, Ms. Bashun recommended are critical. I think that those need to happen. I think that it, it really was a, uh, heading us down the wrong path to include language that attempted to differentiate uh, from another ballot initiative that also could pass alongside. So I think it creates a uh, creates a lot more confusion and uh, I think some people will perceive it as as uh, having some political top spin that that perhaps wasn't intended. Um, so I think it's important to make those changes at a minimum. Uh, in in the meantime, I'll just say we are asking these questions and I just want to really validate that that the framing that the clerk offered is exactly right. We're not questioning the legality uh, of this. We accept that analysis uh, or the value of having an explanatory note. We think that's good. I just think it's really important that we use that scarce space in the explanatory note to describe the things that will be most important. 
uh, to our constituents. And I think that, uh, it, I mean, it seems clear to me that the impact of, uh, you know, changes to constituent services that might change what offices people call for what services uh, are going to be more impactful than the appointment process for the auditor. Uh, in the daily lives of our constituents and the people who will be voting on this. And so I think it's our job to really make sure that we're giving the most uh, important information, especially because this is such a broad and sweeping uh, amendment that it's going to have a lot of consequences. And I think we need to figure out the consequences of, uh, you know, limitations on access to data that are included in this that we haven't even talked about and, and a, a lot of other things that we want to make sure we understand what the consequences are of them so that we can do our job as a council, which is to make sure that what gets put on the ballot is the most relevant and most accurate version of the question we can put to voters so that we really understand their intent and can move forward. Uh, and so I, I, I appreciate Councilmember Palmasano's suggestion. I think that might be one good way to do it. One way or another, we have to get to an understanding of this and we're not asking these questions to challenge uh, to sort of fight out the, the merits of the amendment as much as we are, just to make sure that we even understand it so that we can accurately uh, assess whether the language uh, reflects it or not. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure, uh, and maybe Mr. Clark, you can weigh in. I'd be willing to make a motion to refer this back to staff, but it seems like that's probably procedural, procedurally the best thing for today. Um, is 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 that the best way to handle this so that we're able to move this forward in the way that we need to? Madam Vice President, that would be a great motion to refer the matter back to staff and direct staff to schedule the study session as previously uh, described. Uh, I will uh, make the motion to refer back to staff uh, and to direct staff to uh, arrange the study session. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Fletcher, because I was just trying to figure out what is the procedural way forward that gets at it. Is there a second? Second. second. So we have a proper motion and second. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? For clarity, the motion is to refer the item back to staff uh, as well as to create a, um, a study session to be able to uh, address the many questions that um, uh, members of this body are um, expressing. Um, and um, I don't know, do we need any more clarification on the motion? No, comfortable? I think that's a, a, a good motion. Awesome. Uh, seeing no comments or concerns, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Rake. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Kano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Vice Chair Elson. Aye. Chair Jenkins. Aye. There are 10 ayes. That item carries. Um, and so we will uh, be having a study session, hopefully in the uh, very uh, near coming weeks. Item number 34 on our agenda is a presentation report from New American Economy, um, identifying the demographic contributions of immigrants and refugees to the Minneapolis area. I'll invite, um, Michelle Rivero from the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs to provide that presentation. Ms. Rivero. Thank you so much, Madam Chair Jenkins and additional council members. My name is Michelle Rivero. I'm the Director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs within the Department of Neighborhood and Community Relations. Thank you for considering uh, receipt and file this presentation and report in recognition and honor of Immigrant Heritage Month and World Refugee Day. Uh, next slide, please. 
Immigrant Heritage Month is an opportunity to celebrate the history and achievements of our immigrant residents around the country and here in Minneapolis. President Biden, in recognizing Immigrant Heritage Month this month, has stated the following. Now more than ever, we must do more than celebrate the contributions and honor the sacrifices of immigrants. We must come together as a nation to eradicate the systemic racism that, dies so, that denies so many immigrant minority families their fair shot at the American dream. This Sunday, June 20th, is World Refugee Day, which was established by the United Nations to commemorate an international agreement creating the foundation for refugees to find safety from persecution around the world. This year, as we recognize the 20th anniversary of World Refugee Day, it's worth visiting the UN website as this year's World Refugee Day theme is Together We Heal, Learn and Shine. Immigrants and refugees comprise almost 15% of the population of the city of Minneapolis. In addition to our city residents, many city of Minneapolis employees are themselves immigrants and refugees, or like myself, children of immigrants and refugees. Our immigrant and refugee community experiences, realities, and contributions are stories that need to be elevated, shared, and acted upon. Thanks to the energy and dedication of our city staff across the enterprise, including within the departments acknowledged in this slide, this month there are multiple opportunities to learn about our immigrant and refugee community, talk about developments impacting these community members, and identify existing policies supporting immigrant and refugee including inclusion, including events listed on the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs webpage. Chair Jenkins and committee members, in recognition of Immigrant Heritage Month and World Refugee Day, today's presentation will highlight new, a uh, new comprehensive data report, a New Americans in Minneapolis, published by the organization New American Economy. This report offers critical and timely information, identifying the many strengths of our immigrant and refugee community, and is useful in determining the allocation of resources to promote immigrant and refugee inclusion in the city of Minneapolis. We have access to this important and comprehensive demographic report through Gateways for Growth, an initiative led by the Minneapolis Regional Chamber and supported by the City of Minneapolis. And today we are joined by Grace Waltz from the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, who is prepared to briefly address this initiative and how important our immigrant and refugee communities are to the vibrancy and economic strength of Minneapolis. Grace will then invite Asma Issa and Nan Wu from the organization New American Economy to offer more detail and answer questions about the Gateways for Growth initiative and the data contained within the report offered for a seat and file today. So with your permission, Madam Chair Jenkins, I would invite Grace Walsh from the Minneapolis Regional Chamber to address the committee. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rivero, and welcome, Ms. Waltz. Thank you, Michelle and Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Grace Waltz. I am the Vice President of Public Policy at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. In the fall of 2020, the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, with support from the City of Minneapolis, applied for and was awarded the Gateways for Growth Challenge Grant, making us one of only 19 communities chosen for this opportunity. This opportunity has allowed us to receive support from the organization's New American Economy and Welcoming America, including tailored research on the local economic contributions of, Im of immigrants, which you will be briefed on shortly, as well as direct technical assistance in working with community stakeholders to develop a multi-sector multi strategic plan to improve immigrant and refugee inclusion in the city of Minneapolis. Our state's character is inseparable from the story of immigration, and we know immigration is a cornerstone of Minneapolis's economic competitiveness. We also know there is much more work to be done to ensure immigrants, refugees, and new Americans actually have the resources they need to succeed. The Gateways for Growth initiative gives us the unique opportunity to engage partner organizations and community members across the city to develop a comprehensive set of recommendations to improve immigrant and refugee inclusion in areas including civic engagement, government leadership, access to justice, workforce and economic development, education, amongst others. We intend to share these recommendations with elected leaders and policymakers at the state and local level, as well as leaders in business, philanthropy, and advocacy. We also hope this initiative will highlight the excellent work so many organizations and individuals across the region are doing to address some of these issues and create a forum for these organizations and individuals to work collaboratively. 
The Minneapolis Regional Chamber is honored to play a leadership role in this initiative, and we are grateful to our city partners for their collaboration. And if it is acceptable to you, Chair Jenkins, I'd like to cede the floor to Asma and Nan, who will provide more information about the G4G initiative and walk through the data from this report. Thank you, Ms. Walls, and welcome, Ms. Anan. Hello, thank you, Madam Chair Jenkins and members of the committee. Thank you, Grace, for the kind introduction. Um, I know there's a lot happening in the world right now, and we appreciate the opportunity to die today to present the findings of this report. Um, I just wanted to highlight that I have my colleague, not Nan Wu with me, um, joining me to address any potential questions about the data. And so jumping right in, I just wanted to share a little bit information, a little bit of um, information about the Gateways for Growth program. And also I'm going to start with an overview about new American economy and who we are. Next slide, please. So at New American Economy, we are a bipartisan research and advocacy organization looking to change the narrative about immigrants in America. We were started about 10 years ago, and in our work, we use original research to quantify exactly how immigrants are an asset at every level of our economy and at every level in our communities. And then we use this narrative to bring together leadership across cities, states, and the business community. Next slide, please. The state and local initiatives team has been around for over seven years at this point, and we are really born after comprehensive immigration reform fell apart at the federal level. We saw this real desire from state and local leaders to be more proactive in approaching immigrant immigrant integration and immigration within their own communities. And we work in over 100 communities across the country, from cities as diverse as Grand Forks, North Dakota, to Dallas, Texas. But where we really see traction for our research is in the Midwest, where we know population growth has slowed and workforce shortages have been a real challenge. Next slide. The Gateways for Growth program is one of the ways we support local com uh, communities, and which is the reason we're all here today. This is a competitive challenge that is jointly managed by both New American Economy and Welcoming America, and this program allows communities to apply for support at a couple of different levels. Firstly, in a customized research report, which we'll be speaking about the findings today, and then secondly, through technical assistance over the course of a year in the creation of a multi-sector immigrant inclusion plan. And we're really excited that Minneapolis was selected to receive both levels of support this year, the customized research report and the technical assistance support. Next slide. This year, we're now in our fourth cohort and there were a total of 19 communities selected with nine communities receiving just research reports and 10 communities receiving research reports and technical assistance. So Minneapolis is a part of a really select group and we're thrilled to be working with you all. Next slide. So jumping into some of the findings of the report, um, we just wanted to note that this report encompasses the area, including the city of Minneapolis, and then also part of the city of St. Anthony. And then also to note that for our pur purposes, when we refer to immigrants, we refer to anyone that was not born in the United States and not to US citizen parents. But so that does include immigrants who are naturalized U.S. citizens, those with green cards, those that are here on visas, the undocumented population, those with DACA status and refugees as well. Next slide. In the Minneapolis area, immigrants accounted for 14.9% of the population, which is slightly higher than the national average of 136 of the population, but it is also nearly double the average immigrant population across the state of Minnesota. So we see that Minneapolis, the Minneapolis area is quite diverse. Next slide. We can also see that as a trend over time, population growth is important to look at. Between 2014 and 2019, the overall Minneapolis area population grew by 6.3% and the immigrant population grew by 2.4%. So that means that 5.9% of the overall population growth in the area came from immigrants and refugees. Next slide. 
A critical part of understanding this research is also understanding who immigrants and refugees are in the Minneapolis area. Uh, through our findings, we found that the top 15 countries of origin are listed on this slide here, including Somalia, Mexico, Ethiopia, Ecuador, India, China, Laos, Kenya, Thailand, Korea, El Salvador, Vietnam, Canada, Germany, and Guatemala. Next slide. When we took a look at um, spending power and tax contributions of immigrants and refugees in Minneapolis, we find that they do have a concrete economic impact in the area. And we see that immigrants in the area earned 1.7 billion in 2019 alone. From that, 159 million was paid to state and local taxes, and more than 284 million went to federal taxes. This left immigrants with a total of 1.2 billion in spending power or disposable income, which can be infused back into the local economy. So we see here that immigrants contri are contributing to a tax base that supports the region's infrastructure with a solid foundation of consumer spending that can go back into the local economy. Next slide. We can also look at trends of educational attainment of immigrants over the age of 25 years old. And so we found that education levels of immigrants and refugees in general have been going up over the years and to the point where they're almost equivalent to the US born population in the Minneapolis area. Immigrants play a crucial role in filling gaps in the high skilled workforce, but we also know that there is a workforce need at both ends of the skill spectrum, from doctors and engineers to manufacturing workers and more labor intensive jobs. Next slide. So all of this is great to know, but if immigrants are contributing to the region already, sometimes people ask why is it important to include immigrant integration as part of a community and economic strategy for the region? Um, as I mentioned yesterday, when speaking about how there is particular interest in our work in the Midwest, immigrants are going to be a crucial part of any development strategy for a really simple reason. The US population is getting older, and by 2065, the median age will be 42. Baby boomers are retiring at rapid rates, while 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every single day, and a declining national birth rate. So this is leading to major shortage, uh, shortages across industries, across sectors, and in our workforce. Next slide. Immigrants can play a huge role in counteracting this. Immigrants are more likely to be of working age in the Minneapolis area, where we found that 83.8% of the immigrant population is of working age versus 69.6% .6 of their US born counterparts. People of working age are critical to ensure we have a robust workforce, despite the vote volatility of the past year, and especially as we see communities and businesses opening up more and more, they are facing a real workforce shortage. Next slide. One sector where for years we've seen a chronic shortage of workers is in the STEM fields. Nationally in 2016, there were 13 STEM job postings published online for every one unemployed STEM worker. Next slide. And then when looking at Minnesota in 2015, there were 23.4 STEM job postings published online for every one unemployed STEM worker. These jobs have been particularly critical over the course of the past year. When those jobs go unfilled, companies not only are unable to expand operations or grow, but they can innovate or adapt to quickly changing and evolving markets. Next slide. And again, this is a place where we see immigrants playing an outsized role. Um, immigrants and refugees in the labor force in the Minneapolis area. While 14.9% of the population, immigrants are 15.8% of the employed labor force and 13.4% of STEM workers in the region, meaning that they're uniquely positioned to fill in some of the key workforce shortages that we're seeing. Next slide. And we see this reflected in the occupations that have the highest shares of immigrants and refugees in their workforces. Keeping in mind that again, only 14.7% of the Minneapolis area is foreign born, Despite that, immigrants are filling some really critical roles. More than one out of every five workers uh, in construction are immigrants and transportation and warehousing. Over 19% of manufacturing workers are immigrants and immigrants also account for more than 20% of healthcare and social service 
workers, which are typically industries that require a degree or license, such as legal services, scientific research, accounting. So what we see here is that whether high skilled or lesser skilled, immigrants are playing a huge role in important jobs that keep Minneapolis and keep Minnesota going. Importantly, immigrants living in the Minneapolis area in 2019 helped create or preserve 2,900 local manufacturing jobs that would have vanished or otherwise moved elsewhere, which again speaks to the broader issue that companies can't fill positions not that companies that can't fill positions not only can expand, but they also have difficulty sustaining. Next slide. And as workers and taxpayers, we also take a look at the huge impact that immigrants are making in supporting federal entitlement programs, which is critical to note within the context of the fact that nationally, as our population ages out of the workforce, they will increasingly be relying on these programs. In the Minneapolis area, immigrants and refugees contributed $178 million to Social Security and more than $47 million to Medicare in 2019 alone. Next slide. Additionally, to put this into a national context again, immigrants contributed 182 billion more to Medicare than they drew down between 1996 and 2011. Um, but immigrants are more than workers and taxpayers. They're also entrepreneurs. Next slide. Immigrant entrepreneurs are driving growth both in job creation and in local economic activity. Across the country, we see that immigrants are more likely to be entrepreneurs, employing over 8 million Americans and generating 1.3 trillion in sales. Between 2005 and 2010, the rate of immigrant entrepreneurs nearly doubled. And even after the recession in 2013, immigrants bounced back as entrepreneurs just as quickly as their US-born counterparts. Next slide. In the Minneapolis area, immigrants accounted for over 13.2% of all entrepreneurs. So immigrant entrepreneurs are making significant contributions to the economy. Next slide. As well as being heavy hitters on the business world. Across the country, 44% of Fortune 500 companies in 2020 were founded by either an immigrant or the child of an immigrant. Next slide. Um, before I wrap up my presentation, I wanted to highlight something that's been a bit unique about this current cohort of Gateways for Growth Challenge, which is how to respond and rebuild a community that's more robust and more equitable after a pretty devastating 2020. So while we focus during the strategic planning process on recommendations and ways to build infrastructure that provides for an equitable response and recovery, we wanted to also understand the role that immigrants have played as essential workers. And one of the focuses for this year's cohort is understanding the role of immigrants as essential workers. And again, we see immigrants really punching above their weight. Um, in the in Minneapolis area, we found that immigrants account for 42.3% of essential service workers, which includes things like building, cleaning, waste management, and other items. Um, they also account for 28.7% of construction workers, above 25% of transportation and warehousing workers, more than 18% of healthcare workers, and 18% of food service workers. Uh, particularly in the pandemic, these are really important positions and occupations and we see how immigrants are stepping up when it came to our health care supporting our food supply chain and transporting our goods so we didn't always have to physically go into stores and showing all of us what being essential really means next slide we also look take a, took a look at the naturalization in of immigrants in the minneapolis area and found that 45.1 percent of immigrants and refugees in the area are naturalized 16.6 percent are potentially eligible and 38.4 percent are not eligible next slide when looking at the housing wealth in the minneapolis area we found that 24.8 percent of immigrant households owned their home compared to 52.6 percent of the u.s born um, immigrant households ha held a total of 1.9 billion in property value and they also contributed 215 million in annual rent next slide so I'll wrap it up there, but the overall picture that these data points gives is that immigrants play an important role in the community, the economy, and the workforce of the Minneapolis area. They keep the workforce young, boost tax bases, enlarge consumer bases, and contribute their skills and labor to important industries in key occupations in the metro area. Um, I just want to leave you all with a few uh, 
uh, resources that I'll include in the chat, um, one of which is Map the Impact that New American Economy runs. It's a tool that provides top line data on all 435 congressional districts, all 50 states, all 100 largest metro areas and all 3000 um, more than 3000 counties across the country. And so the data that is in the report New Americans in Minneapolis is being released today is much more comprehensive than what we do have in Map the Impact, but it is a great tool if you just want um, to look around in some basic top line data. Next slide. The next resource I will share is the Gateways for Growth Challenge website that um, the City of Minneapolis and Minneapolis Regional Chamber are both awardees of for this year, um, which will let you see all of the former G4G communities, their research briefs and their published strategic plans. Um, I encourage you to take a look if you're interested in seeing how other communities have approached this work. Next slide. And with that, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much for the time and opportunity. And I'll open it up to any questions about any of the data findings, the methodology, or how um, any questions about the Gateways for Growth program as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Issa. Is that pronounced yes, correctly? Correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Um, are there any questions? Councilmember Osman. Uh, thank you, uh, staff, Michelle, and thank you, Growth, um, for that wonderful report. I think it shows us that uh, immigrant communities that I'm part of uh, contribute our society in here in Minneapolis and the state. Um, and it's 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 a wonderful thing, and I'm so glad to Here's such a presentation that's showing the positive thing uh, from 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 our from my community. Um, the, the 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 important role they play in our society, uh, the jobs that Americans don't want to do that are, that they are doing it. Uh, the workforce we we see the data and that is a positive thing. So I would encourage uh, uh, the city of Minneapolis and the state to really. Look, at, in, look into this data and um, make sure that we're, we're making our policies and, 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 and the laws we're making uh, uh, towards uh, better in people's lives and better in immigrants. And what the immigrants need is um, uh, protection. Uh, they went through uh, four years of Donald Trump. Um, you know, they go through a lot of uh, different challenges uh, coming here, being a new person, and uh, making a life out of out of that whatever opportunity that that we get from from living in this country, we're, we're so thankful. And um, uh, the policies and 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 the legislative work we do has to reflect the community uh, that are that are here that are contributing a lot. Um, one of the things I would say, uh, Councilmember Fletcher brought a uh, right to call, right to, right to recall uh, for hospitality. That is the kind of policy we want to see. Uh, in my word, you see uh, truck drivers, um, so many truck drivers that are that are uh, 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 that are here that are working. Um, all of a sudden, in, in ten years. Uh, we have full of trucks in Minneapolis. We want to. This is not uh, um, something that uh, that just came. It's just they are a part of the community. They are doing the jobs that uh, that is uh, demand that uh, Americans don't want to do, and we want to make sure we are setting up policies that are protecting these individuals and uh, respecting their rights and uh, also investing. We have to invest our youth. We have large youth that are immigrants. We have uh, hardworking people that are uh, waking up every day to not live the American dream. So I would encourage my colleagues and uh, the state to really uh, uh, put their policies and uh, invest immigrant communities. And I so thankful for for that presentation and the staff uh, for providing this and 
um, really showing the positive highlight of the immigrant contribution in our society. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Asman. Um, are there any other comments or questions? Seeing none, um, I do want to just thank uh, Ms. Rivero and all of our presenters for that uh, really insightful um, presentation um, honoring um, immigrants in our community and recognizing um, Immigrant Heritage Month and uh, World Refugee um, Month. And so um, I will um, go ahead and move approval of this item, which does include uh, a resolution. Um, is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Rake. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cunningham. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Kano. Councilmember Kano. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Councilmember Kano. Vice Chair Ellison. Aye. Chair Jenkins. Aye. There are 10 ayes. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk, and that item is approved. Um, item number 35 on our agenda is an update on the financial analysis of the community engagement evaluation recommendations. And I'll now invite uh, Ms. Cheyenne Brodeen from the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department to introduce this item. Good afternoon, Council Vice President Jenkins and committee members. Uh, my name is Cheyenne Brodeen, and I am the Internal Services Manager with the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department. And we are before you today uh, to present the financial analysis of the recommendations uh, from the Community Engagement Evaluation. And this is a receive and file item. Uh, and I am joined uh, by my colleagues uh, from the city coordinator's office and the finance office, and I will pause uh, for them to introduce themselves. Thank you, Cheyenne, uh, Chair Jenkins, members of the committee. My name is Renee Youngs. I'm a policy and research management analyst in the city coordinator's office. Hey, I'm Neil Younghands. I'm a senior budget and evaluation analyst in the Office of Finance and Property Services. Thank you. Uh, next You're slide, welcome. please. Um, so, um, we wanted to provide just a quick overview of our presentation today. Uh, we'll give some background information um, on this work um, and quickly uh, speak to the value of engagement and why it's important that we do it right. Uh, provide an overview of the main cost areas and give some context into the assumptions uh, that were used uh, to develop the analysis. And uh, I will then uh, turn it over to Renee Youngs to go into further detail around um, each specific cost area. Um, then we'll uh, wrap up with next steps. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in May 2019, uh, the City Council uh, issued a staff directive 
to the city coordinator's office to conduct an evaluation of the city's internal engagement efforts and to provide guidance and recommendations on how the city might improve the proactivity and diversity of its engagement to align with enterprise goals and maximize resources. Through a competitive RFP process, Calibri Consulting was chosen and the evaluation was conducted from January 2020 to November 2020. In January 2021, the final evaluation report was presented to City Council with recommendations uh, in two broad categories. Uh, one of them is to systematize equitable engagement capacity, and the other one is to develop, to develop a uh, re uh, 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 equitable relational learning culture. And in and an outcome of that presentation was to conduct a financial analysis of those recommendations. And that is what we are before you today to present. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the evaluation uh, developed this graphic or narrative of what community engagement is and found that community engagement in Minneapolis really centers around uh, three separate functions. Uh, one of them is relationship building, which is the core of, of, of what is needed um, for any engagement activity is to really um, have connections and relationships with residents and communities that you're trying to engage with. The second is that um, the city uh, does engagement through interactions of core functions. And really, really this is um, our city, how our city works through assessments, co-compliance, uh, but also through um, communicating information about programs and services. And then lastly, um, uh, ten intentional community engagement, really being intentional about how you are connecting with and asking community to participate and engage with the city. Uh, next slide, please. The evaluation report also described the benefits of excellent community engagement practices, and they are strengthening democracy, improved outcomes on city goals and vision, increased trust and deeper relationships, improved city capacity and reputation. So when we do community engagement right, this is the outcome and this is the value we are getting for that. Um, and this is a quote from a resident who participated in the community engagement evaluation, and it really ties together the description of what community engagement is and why we do it and what the benefits of, com of doing community engagement right are. Next slide, please. Uh, so there were a total of 20 pages of recommendations that resulted in, in many uh, individual recommendations in the final um, community engagement evaluation report. So when we um, began this, uh, the task of completing this financial analysis, we took a look at all of the recommendations in, in the report um, and sorted through which recommendations had costs above and beyond uh, current staff time. And so when we did that, we ended up with these four high level bucket areas, uh, which are uh, community engagement policy changes, training and development, staff or FTEs, and um, this one, which is a kind of a smaller, smaller bucket area, but uh, there was a recommendation for uh, a one time engagement policy task force. And so later in this report, Renee will go through each bucket area in more detail to break down the specific costs associated with each area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one thing I do um, want to share is that today's presentation is only a reporting of potential costs. We are not um, providing any staff recommendation on how to structure the implementation of, of this. Uh, the purpose is really to ensure that policymakers and community members understand the costs of these recommendations and in order to help set priorities and strategy for moving forward. Uh, we are asking for your help uh, to, to guide the priorities of this work and discussion today, as well as in conversations in the in weeks and months ahead. 
We're also going to be connecting with city leaders, staff, and community to weigh in and priorities as well. That will inform a staff-driven policy development process that will involve all departments and continue to include engagement with community as this work moves forward. I also um, want to mention too that the implementation will be phased and we uh, pl plan to do some work between now and the next budget cycle. So we don't have any budget asks related to this work for 2022, but perhaps through some staff work um, may bring some in 2023. And uh, also wanted to just mention that the total costs you will see in the following slides are costs that are inclusive of any of the estimated existing spend on engagement activities, such as food, space rental, facilitation costs, um, um, as well as um, whatever uh, all of the um, increase or, or uh, new dollars that are uh, part of this analysis. So the new spend will be less. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, as we uh, began to do the research and pull the various costs together, we realized that there was uh, such a large range in the variations for each item that we had to develop some calculation assumptions. And I will briefly touch on them now. Uh, so you have these uh, uh, as we're sharing the information, but you will see the assumptions listed out for each of the specific item as Renee goes through them. Um, and just also wanted to mention that you can find the evaluation recommendations on page 124 through 144 of the final evaluation report. And so for uh, the unit cost estimates for engagement activities, we estimated the total cost of each policy change for the type of engagement activity, whether it be a focus group, uh, the translation of a print material, a facilitated meeting. Um, and so for the total cost of those per activity costs were multiplied by an estimate of the, of the frequency of the various types of activities that were derived from the evaluation report. So when we um, were collecting data from departments, we have an, uh, some um, information that led us to how many types of these, you know, whether it be a focus groups or a public meeting, how many types of those occurred over, over a year period um, across the city and across departments. So that's what we used um, for figuring out how many of these types of activities uh, occurred. And uh, given the range of participation for engagement activities and, and how that in, can impact the total cost um, for um, each engagement activity um, and the varying ranges given in some of the recommendations, um, whether it be, you know, you could have one or two, you know, the recommendations proposed one or two staff or uh, 10 to 18 staff, we uh, included lower use and higher use scenarios for the relevant items to show that cost range uh, for the purposes of this analysis. And um, we are also assuming that there will be an increase in the, the volume of engagement activities in the future as a result of the implementation. So that's included in this cost. This isn't a, an assessment of what we're doing now, but we've included for th that increased volume. Um, and cost estimates are based on comparable products or activities. So we, we looked at um, some in, uh, available um, engagement training sessions that are available now um, through IAP2 and other organizations, and we worked with um, HR to understand um, some of the training programs that they offer, what the cost would be to, to create something similar around engagement, and that's how we, um, those are the types of ways that we gathered some of the information on uh, comparable products and activities for, for our cost estimates. And then um, for compensation, uh, 
and the estimated staffing cost, we used um, comparable uh, salaries for similar types of work of current FTEs and current positions um, at the city. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also wanted to just touch base on two other po points before we dig into the numbers. Um, uh, so for the estimates of total current spend, we worked with a department to get their 2019 actuals of their engagement costs for that year. We then got the percentage of that based on their 2019 budget. So the percentage is 0.4% of what they spent on engagement. And we took that 0.4% against the total enterprise budget to get um, a cost of $1.8 million a year of uh, total spend that the city spends on engagement. We also wanted to point out that there may be some potential to redirect some current spending, such as looking at costs that we allocate or use for outside vendors versus building capacity internally. Um, these are just some, some things to keep in mind as we go through the numbers and as we share this information. So I will now uh, turn it over to Renee Youngs to walk through the details around each cost category. Thank you, Cheyenne. Thank you again, Chair Jenkins and members of the committee. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so I will be briefly describing on these next dozen or so slides, very briefly, I promise, uh, the potential line item costs for different types of recommendations. Uh, this detail is a little granular. It's intended to help everyone uh, who is viewing the document in the presentation understand and compare the costs of implement implementing each specific item. There's also a summary of total costs for implementing recommendations at the end of this presentation. The first eight items you'll see are specific policy changes recommended in the evaluation report. Some of these are recommendations for new or changed policies. Others like this one for translation of print and media materials are recommendations to more consistently use certain practices that uh, are, are already in play in the enterprise. On each slide, you'll see a summary of the assumptions and unit costs that went into each calculation. A uh, unit cost is the cost for uh, a particular type of changed practice under the policy recommendation uh, for a single activity. So for instance, a single focus group, a single public meeting, a single flyer being translated in this case. You'll also see two different dollar figures, one for the lower cost and one for the higher cost scenario that Cheyenne mentioned a moment ago. For some items like this one, those values are the same and for some they're different. And uh, I will elaborate on what drives the lower and higher use scenarios on the slides where they differ. Next slide, please. Similar, oh, that, that, that is a very helpful recap of the type of uh, line items we're gonna be seeing in the rest of these slides uh, in the four buckets of recommendations that Cheyenne mentioned ago, just as a refresher. We have this group of policy changes, a set of training and development recommendations, uh, added staff capacity and then the engagement policy task force. Next slide, please. Similar to the, the first line item slide, this recommendation is about more consistent translation and interpretation services for meeting and events. So uh, the same structure of assumptions and calculations, but for live activities rather than uh, print or other media materials. Next slide, please. This recommendation was related to bringing in outside facilitators for some meetings and events. The evaluation report noted this may be an ongoing need even as the city builds greater capacity to facilitate engagement, but likely not for all or even most events. The assumption here that you see is for 20% of certain types of comparatively intensive activities. Next slide, please. The recommendation to provide childcare at certain in-person events or meetings 
is one example of a recommendation that needs to undergo risk additional staff review, uh, particularly for its legal and risk management implications. But we've included it here to give you a sense of the potential costs that we calculated. Next slide, please. The recommended recommendation to include or to locate more in person activities in participants, communities and neighborhoods drives this potential cost. While some meetings are appropriate to hold at city facilities and others are appropriate to hold in other free community venues. For the purposes of estimation, we assumed that 50% of in person events might have associated venue rental costs at locations in community. Next slide, please. Transportation reimbursement for community members is the first of what we described in our process as variable cost policy change recommendations. That is, the costs would be higher or lower depending on the level of participation or attendance at engagement activities. So greater participation has higher costs as reflected in the higher use scenario here versus the lower use scenario. Next, please. The estimation process for offering food at engagement events or meetings follows the same logic and pretty similar low and high cost uh, scenarios as the transportation reimbursement item. This is a case where the city has a policy in place for the purchase and use of food at meetings and the evaluation report recommends revising that policy in order to essentially remove barriers to food purchases as an aspect of relationship building work with communities. Next slide, please. The final variable cost policy change recommendation is around compensating engagement participants for their expertise. It's important to note that this estimate is based on use for only certain engagement activities where attendees may be expected to participate and give feedback more intensively. So for instance, not attendees at a community meeting, but rather participants in an advisory group or a series of interviews or so on. Next slide, please. This slide shows a subtotal of the estimated costs of implementing all of the eight policy change recommendations on the previous slides. Again, you see the variation between lower and higher cost scenarios based largely on the estimated level of community participation. The assumption here uh, in the longer term is also that highly effective engagement practices will spur and support increased participation. So actual costs may hypothetically move from the lower cost scenario toward the higher cost scenario over time. Next slide, please. The second major cost area is for training and development cost. And the costs you see on this slide are for two separate areas of training combined. The technical skills needed to do effective engagement work and anti-racism training with wide enterprise participation to wrap around those skills and all our work with an equitable approach. Uh, within these high level costs are a variety of training formats to better reach staff with different professional needs and different learning styles. The lower and higher cost scenarios in this area are primarily driven by different estimated levels of staff attendance in the various training opportunities. The level of both one time and ongoing staff time needed to develop and facilitate all these trainings led to a cost assumption about additional training staff. One FTE in the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department to manage engagement training, and one FTE in the Division of Race and Equity to manage anti-racism training. Those training staff costs are reflected on this slide rather than with other recommended city staff on the next slide. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes a second set of capacity building recommendations from the evaluation. Adding staff with engagement expertise to support departments and the enterprise. There were two recommendations in the evaluation report around building capacity in these two different areas. Uh, first, ensuring that there is in-house engagement expertise within departments, which you see here in the first two bullet points of the summary and also building NCR's capacity to support the enterprise with inward looking staff in addition to the outward looking 
community specialists that already do such great work. Those are reflected in the, the next three bullet points on this slide. The driver of differences between the two cost scenarios on this slide is the equitable engagement specialists recommendation in that first bullet point. In the report, that item is less prescriptive about which departments may need how many staff. It notes that all quote large departments should have one or two engagement experts to serve as a resource within departments. Thus the variation in cost scenarios. Uh, there were a, a number of different potential scenarios that we looked at. Next slide, please. While well, some specific policy recommendations emerged in the evalu evaluation, and we've seen those already today, the report also recommends creating a time limited task force to complete a full review of the city's engagement related policies. Costs outlined here are rel related to presumptive meeting costs and per diem compensation for community rep representatives who may participate in that task force. Next slide, please. This slide rolls up the line items on all of the previous slides to show the total estimated cost if all recommendations in the evaluation report were to be implemented. Uh, recall as a reference, uh, Cheyenne mentioned that our estimate of the city's current spend on engagement costs is roughly $1.8 million. Next slide, please. This slide shows the same total estimated cost of implementing all recommendations and breaks it down into the four cost areas that we reviewed in order to show the relative total estimate for each area to give you a sense of where the costs are coming from uh, in one image. Uh, I'll reiterate what Cheyenne said in, in her background information as well, that this is a reporting of information to you in order to help determine city priorities. It's not a staff recommendation, not a budget request, uh, but these are the, the estimates that staff developed to give you a sense of of what it would take to adopt all of the recommendations that were outlined. Uh, that that concludes my sharing of the the line items for the recommendations, and uh, I will I will hand the presenting duties back to Cheyenne to share a bit about next steps. Uh, thank you, Renee. Um, next slide, please. So uh, some of the next steps that we outlined um, to keep this work mo moving forward is uh, to go forth and gather input on priorities among these policy recommendations. Um, we'd like to begin to convene a staff work group and start to develop um, work plans and timelines um, once we have those uh, policy priorities um, identified and then as I stated earlier, it's our hope to come back um, with some potential um, uh, requests added in the 2023 budget process um, and really um, make sure that this is uh, anything that gets implemented from this work is a, a phased approach. And so um, that um, concludes our presentation and we will uh, stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Brodine and Ms. Youngs. Um, it's a very, very um, detailed overview on a day when we have been getting lots of information. And I do see that we have some um, comments or questions from Council Member Gordon and then Fletcher. And I can be brief. I just really appreciate all the information and going in depth like this so much. It's a lot to um, figure out and um, maybe look at and dig into later, especially as we're thinking about the budget uh, into the future. I think it makes a lot of sense to maybe have a test course help do that. Um, I was thinking of like what kind of expenses are going on now? Translations was one, for example. We're already contracting out and spending a lot. And is this on top of that or is it combined? And, and we would we save some money somewhere if we did it? So that's something to think about. Of course, it's a lot of money if we're going to try to do the high end of everything and it looks pretty daunting, but I think there's some things we should uh, focus on and prioritize and I look forward to the ongoing discussion and I won't try to take us down too long of a uh, trail as four o'clock is quickly approaching. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sam Gordon. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Council Vice President, and uh, thank you for this presentation and for the thought you're putting into this. I, I you know, I, I think seven to ten million dollars sounds like a lot of money until you consider the cost that the city is paying for not having this capacity this year. Uh, I think we can all feel the ways that community engagement has been something that we all wish in retrospect had been invested in much more aggressively and much more uh, robustly and that we had a lot more capacity and trust built uh, going into some very tough times. And I think uh, one of the things that's happened is that the the, the pandemic and uh, the multiple tragedies that our community has faced um, have revealed some real uh, gaps. Uh, that that this looks to me like it could, uh, you know, be a real attempt at filling. So I really uh, appreciate this. I want to really encourage you uh, to keep in touch with. I know many of our offices as as this is developing towards a 2023 budget ask. Let's let's even thinking about the 2022 budget if there's development money or uh, you know pilot money that will make sure that we're really ready to make the right ask and and build towards the right thing to to get our city to a place that we can achieve a more robust engagement program uh, and a more effective engagement program and ultimately I mean this is all about building community trust and buy-in and and improving our democracy and I think this is very important work so uh, please do keep in touch and keep developing this. I think this is a, a promising document uh, to have this level of detail and and uh, planning going into this work. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll have follow up questions, but we'll save those for another day. Great, uh, Council President Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'll also be brief. It's a long day. I just did want to thank the staff so much for their work on this. It's been so thoughtful and inclusive and um, forward looking, you know, so planful. I just really deeply appreciate it. Um, I actually helped uh, with the staff direction to work on this, uh, a function that may soon be banned <laughs> in our system of government. Um, but, you know, I do think this work in planning how we do community engagement matters a lot. Um, one of the reasons I thought this was important is because from our vantage point as council members, we can see how much capacity is there is for engagement around different kinds of decisions that get made. And I often tell this to staff and other departments. Um, public Works, for example, amazing department. Um, I'm glad they have these resources has an enormous amount of resources for, for the reconstruction of a road. They often have a consultant on board. There's a series of community meetings that are well supported and staffed. They're working closely with the council office in that instance under the current structure of government. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying they shouldn't have those resources, but it is so much more robust than often departments will have when they're trying to do a large policy uh, proposal or some very kind of uh, longer term work. Um, at times we've invested in specific kinds of engagement like around the 2040 plan and I think we're benefiting from that really clear outcome based uh, uh, engagement. And then I know that our staff of color, our staff with language abilities, our council members of color and their staff in their offices with cultural competency and language abilities are doing a lot of heavy lifting in addition to all the other things. Um, either that's in the staff's responsibility or as our policymakers. Um, that is essentially, you know, they're doing engagement on behalf of the city. Um, and I think in the case of staff often, you know, perhaps not being compensated for that part of their work. So they're like being asked to do engagement um, based on skills and competencies um, that may not be part of their official job description. So these are some of the things that I need think we need to work out. I did say this to staff when we met. I do think it actually matters what happens with the government structure discussions. Um, and I think it's just worth reflecting on um, how would this shift if decisions became more administrative in nature, um, implemented by departments, um, you know, who ultimately would then report to the mayor or if the mayor themselves would be making more of these decisions in the, in a different structure. And it, it would likely affect the ways that we would resource engagement across the enterprise. 
Um, not that it's bad or good, but just would be likely different. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And again, I do echo the um, uh, appreciation for the uh, depth and uh, detail that this work presents and uh, look forward to, uh, to working with you all uh, as we move forward to bring some of these recommendations into fruition, and maybe all of them. Um, certainly it's a budget issue, uh, but as Councilmember Fletcher noted, um, you know, what's the cost of not uh, fully engaging our community? So uh, appreciate the efforts and um, seeing no further discussion, I will direct the clerk to file that report. And with that, colleagues, we have concluded all the business to come before this committee today, and we are adjourned. Thank you.